and uh, yes, this presentation is dedicated to a new platform, Swedish natural resource infrastructure called Incarits, and my name is Emmanuel, uh, and I'm connected to yeah, various, uh, let's say, institutions and platforms at the LA University, also connected to links. And uh, for Incarits, uh, I will uh, explain a little bit briefly. So Infravis has nine Swedish uh, partners, nine Swedish universities. It's financed by the Swedish Research Council. And uh, the goal of Infravis is basically to help users for coming from Swedish academia uh, initially. And then as a step two, we we'll see if we can also extend the help to the industry. But at, at this step, it, it's open for all Swedish universities, even those which are not partners of Infravis. And the idea is to help users to visualize the data, and this can evolve, let's say, during virtual reality, augmented reality, in machine learning of the data in order to then come to a visualization, or even working with text data or 2D, 3D data sets, sets. And there are also a set of visualization centers connected to uh, some of these universities, for example, Linköping University and University of Gothenburg, where they have these big visualization domes. Um, and this is basically a, a, yeah, a small map of all the experts and administrators, coordinators uh, working in Infravis. So uh, in total, there are around 50 visualization experts. Uh, there's also a sort of steering committee. Uh, Melvin Davis is here on spot in the audience today. Uh, most of you are online. Uh, and there's also a scientific advisory board with Marjolein Kunisset and Max Ford, where it's Helge Hauser from the University of Bergen and Michael Ruttinger from the German Climate Computing Center in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, from these, uh, let's say, experts, we are also a set of nine coordinators, or eight, if you cal uh, calculate correctly. And uh, we are basically uh, trying to work as a compact content organized, uh, let's say, on each respective node in the university they work. And uh, at Lund University, uh, we are actually a, a set of, let's say, it's the labs connected to Infravis. So there is the CIPA, Correlated Image Processing Analysis. We have uh, the Virtual Reality Laboratory, which is located at the Inmar Kanta Design Center uh, in the basement. And they also teach virtual reality to students. Uh, the Lunark, uh, the computing cluster with a new cluster called Cosmos. Uh, there's also the Keen uh, Initiative, uh, which is a virtual platform between uh, Denmark and Max Ford and the University. Uh, and then we have the humanities lab uh, and also AI Lund and uh, uh, yeah, more in detail the math, uh, let's say, department with Alexandros Sopasakis and Karl uh, Let's see. Yes, and then we also have UMAS, who is at Elbik and also has a shared position also at CIPA and Intros. And uh, you, you might wonder what can Intros do for you. So uh, we have these little key points. Uh, so basically, we can try and increase your research impact. We can basically help you to uh, write research grants and input the visualization part, which might help you to better, uh, let's say, construct a better grant application, let's say. Uh, it could involve also communicating to society as a third, let's say, assignment, uh, which exists at all Swedish universities. And also, uh, hopefully, get some further insights into your data and with the help of various data analysis and tailor make certain visualization solutions that you might not have thought about before and then if they're presented by these uh, 50 experts you might be like okay that uh, visualization i really want that would really help me in, in my explain my research uh, and then basically uh, we can work a little bit across the whole uh, spectrum let's say from data collection and creation with a small part thesis that I will speak about soon uh, to, let's say, machine learning and AI uh, of your data sets uh, to performing statistical data analysis, uh, data visualization, of course, and also interactive and collaborative research analysis. And uh, if we switch back to, let's say, data collection and creation, if we think of, let's say, X-ray and neutron tomography, you, you, I, I, I feel I need to point out. So it's not really that we uh, spend, let's say, five days with a user at a beamline at Max Ford collecting data, but it could, for example, involve that perhaps we will come and uh, visit the beam time uh, during the initial days, make sure you have good contrast, uh, let's say, in your in your yeah, images, uh, perhaps suggest something on the exposure time, 
great number of reaction images in the tomography because if we can interact here, let's interact a little bit. Uh, when you're collecting the data, you speak about images, and it can also be images related to composer microscopy, but any type of imaging uh, visualize. It can actually help our further work along this line because if there's not enough contrast, we might need machine learning to segment something. But if there is a good contrast and high resolution in the spectroscopy related acquisition parameters, perhaps normal grayscale level thresholding is sufficient so we can minimize certain things. So, uh, and this is also what many people like to say at various uh, yeah, around the world try to strive to have a better, better uh, interaction between the ones that analyze the data and the ones that acquire the data. Uh, so, that is what I want to relate to images. But if you think of uh, scraping, uh, words from let's say databases or uh, applications or uh, uh, as in one example exists where they under infrared they collected certain words from social media and they made plots i mean that is another type of collecting data let's say. Uh, and as an example of this where uh, let's say uh, I, I want to present this uh, which is not yet related to infrared but it's related to, to links this is a project we ran under the team called modern lives of food and uh, <clears throat> There was funding from the Swedish Innovation, sorry, Swedish Innovation Agency, that's the spread. And um, these users, Nick Sylvjowski and Mats Hansson from the University and uh, Oakley, they have access to seats from a van. And uh, usually they would do light microscopy, fluorescent microscopy. Uh, and these are two images. And we wanted to, they wanted to have a 3D representation of the seats, especially a certain uh, cell structure. Uh, so we did a lot of scans with lab-based microtomography and we realized that the contrast was not sufficient and uh, we scanned let's say, the entire seed and uh, we iterated this process many times and we cut the seeds to make them smaller uh, and, and then the idea was to zoom in and make more high resolution scans and uh, we realized that we had to get even more contrast so we borrowed something from the uh, biology world so we stain the seeds with pka which stands for phosphatic transparent acid and then we could actually much better see certain is uh, let's say structures in the cell layer uh, that they want to see because this is where uh, they will find the so-called beta glutein uh, and then uh, we scan the samples uh, we scan a lot of samples more probably more than 50 or 70 different scans we did and uh, then we were sanding that with a lot of data, and uh, since we had stained it, it was difficult to apply classical image processing and segmentation. So then we looked in more to some machine learning uh, based methods. And this is Alexander Supasakis, who's also part of Infravis and SIPA. And he took a look at this data. And uh, we also hired two summer students this summer who sat and annotated hundreds of these images that they then provided to Alexandros, and then he could refine the machine learning based segmentation methods. Uh, and this is an example of how, uh, let's say, now, now this example has involved, uh, let's say, links and land numerous and other affiliations of us. But in, in a parallel world, uh, let's say, being able to work across here and suggest, uh, let's say, uh, fine tune image acquisition parameters or uh, how to work with data, that is also something that we as we say, infrared could suggest something so so that in, in a parallel imagine that we would have come with this data here in that middle upper part and then we would have to do a lot more work now now they are quite nice contrast and, and so on uh, and perhaps the infrared will be involved if there will be some further visualization but right right now the focus in is on just uh, trying to extract numbers from these forms and concept by something quantitative and then the idea is trying to feed this information back to the secular industry so they can get informed how to grind down the seeds, let's say. Uh, so this is one example. There should be a, a PR publication about this uh, in the links newsletter quite soon as well. We have seen now a response from the PowerPoint presentation. Paris hello. No. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, and this pyramid here shows you the type of support you can get from infra. It's like on the on the lowest, uh, let's say, on the first step, let's say, you can contact, uh, let's say, infra with the, uh, the, the homepage and you can send in a support request, uh, so-called help desk. And this could be, for example, that you, 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 you're just asking a few questions, which software can I use for this and that. It might involve a few hours of support and, and so on. So it's, let's say, email, let's say. 
And in the middle level, you can actually uh, request free of charge support uh, up to 80 hours uh, with help of visualizing your data and so on. But if you want more than 80 hours of support, well, then you, you might need to apply for another project or you can send in this really, uh, which we have at least once per year. The next deadline should be sometime in spring, uh, next year, 2024, where you can apply for a larger project. Uh, basically, the same way that you send in an application to, let's say, a synchrotron or a neutron source. And, and this could involve, where, uh, let's say, you getting hundreds of hours, maybe 300 hours. We, we, we'll see. Um, the first projects, these are some pilot projects that were done prior to this uh, in-depth open call. And uh, you can see across which disciplines in how it works. Uh, and uh, basically looking into climate changes, helping with users with that, visualizing uh, online activism factors. And this is what I mentioned before of scraping information from social media. It could involve uh, visualizing some, uh, some models on airflow, let's say, related to uh, how cars, uh, let's say, drive or airplanes fly. And uh, uh, these other ones, which I will uh, show a little bit more in detail, is let's say doing VR applications in the cloud without having the need to have a really strong stationary PC possible. And this like saying patients, uh, in, let's say creating a digital twin of yourself and doing mo modifications of uh, when it comes to training and uh, nutrition. Uh, and that is a, an example. This is a pilot project that was supported by Linshot University and they created a medical twin of this person. So they made, first made a face scan and then they, they mapped uh, the face onto a 3D model, and then they created this digital screen. And this is a short video where they can actually vary, let's say, how much this person is training, what the person is eating, and they can see how this affects, uh, let's say, the health in the digital world. And then you can try and realize uh, how would this affect me in the, in the normal world if I would follow all these workout routines and suggestions when it comes to eating. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if we switch into the X-ray uh, world, let's say, uh, I, I already presented one example prior there with a data acquisition and gave some advice. Uh, this is uh, Giuseppe Bianco, who's from uh, the 3D lab at the Department of Evolutionary Ecology. He actually has this uh, setup that is called photogrammetry, which is basically a setup where you, uh, yeah, you spin the sample and uh, uh, you make high resolution photographs of the sample so you can in the end obtain, let's say, a 3D surface scan of your sample. And these type of scans, they take hours, possibly five hours or more. And uh, the other week, we made a small test at the uh, Department of Biology because they bought a new uh, CT scanner. And we scanned a bug that you would usually scan with this photogrammetry machine. And this uh, scan uh, took roughly five or seven minutes. Uh, and then we, we visualized it and um, it, it, it was, let's say, quite quick, let's say. And uh, Giuseppe's goal is basically to, now it's something that's supporting studies, because in, in some scenarios, they, they might just want to have, let's say, the free surface, seeing the inside might not be needed, but uh, doing that with photogrammetry would take so many hours. If you can do it so quickly with x-rays and then just fill the void inside, you just extract the free surface, and then he would like to upload it to this online uh, cloud platforms that he has uh, uh, sketched out, uh, spin it around and show it uh, for evolutionary purposes, somehow you know, insects and animals are developing. Um, going back to the more in-depth support projects, there was an application that ended in uh, June and 45 projects were received uh, from 14 universities. Uh, some of the universities uh, are most of them are public interest, some are not, but this doesn't matter. They are of interest also to all Swiss universities. Uh, and you can see that the applications span from humanities, natural science, social science, biology, engineering science, and medicine. And uh, we will take a look at one of these applications because one of them is actually related to X ray tomography. So here uh, is actually Elena Philipson from the university, and this is her Richard group. Uh, with Vanas, uh, Marco, and Constance. And uh, they sent an application and they wrote, uh, I think, two to five pages describing what they need help with. So they have actually extracted these so called microfossils that they have, uh, they have drilled down hundreds of meters in the, in the sea, uh, in the sea between Denmark and Sweden. 
and they can extract these uh, microprocessors from the, from the soil. And then they have scanned them. They have done hundreds of scans at the uh, solution from uh, at anatomic streamline, and also uh, they have scanned at uh, Spring 8 in, in Japan. Uh, and um, these microprocessors, they will have small pores, and these pores will are, can be related to how much uh, oxygen and pH these uh, let's say animals receive during their lifetime. So you can actually relate. The shape uh, and the structures of these microprocessors to the climate, uh, actually, and see how it developed over hundreds of years. So you can go back in time. And I can also mention that uh, Vienna is also part of another link scheme called Environment and Climate, which is a, a core group member of the World Group One. And uh, uh, within this project, we have we are assigned as a five experts and interns from the university. And uh, we, we, we're trying to, the, the data will be uploaded in a few weeks, and we will see if we will or will not need machine learning in trying to separate these, uh, these samples from each other and also to refine certain, uh, let's say, uh, segmentation of this uh, micro force, let's say. Uh, and then we will see if we have suggestions and ideas on how to further visualize this and uh, perhaps even do a a nice let's say, interactive uh, virtual reality experience for going from the sample site to the lab to some from and so on. Uh, and then uh, something we have worked with both let's say, internally and externally and better, let's say, explain uh, the skills of all the experts in the intro is uh, something designing with that skill part. Because uh, up to now, uh, we had a so-called competence map. So here on the Y axis, you have the list of all the super experts, and then they have checked in what skills they have with respect to certain programs, be it machine learning, visualization tools, and so on. And then uh, something, and this is quite difficult to overview. You might need to sum up the, the numbers and so on. So we have tried, uh, at least now at the learning node, and more uh, notes will follow hopefully. We have uh, designed this also called skill cards where you can see, let, let's say, what skills a certain interest expert has which projects, some example projects they have worked in, uh, and so on. Uh, and then for my part, uh, I, I like to, uh, let's say, uh, work with this so-called uh, tomography scanner with visible light, where I can scan uh, certain samples for educational purposes and people can, can train in tomography, uh, and also in the construction and image analysis. And then in some, uh, let's say, applied projects, I have quantified the various, uh, let's say, uh, defects in steel uh, for uh, switch companies that's Cantal and Sabi, and then we can extract numbers uh, on this with, with respect to all the samples. Um, and uh, another person, this is Alexander Sukasakis, that I mentioned before. This is his field card, and he comes from the Department of Mathematics. And uh, he has actually done here on the left side the um, Anja Schmidt Christensen, uh, who's also in the university. They annotated a set of uh, samples of uh, numerically, and uh, he managed to run that in the in machine learning network that he set up, and he managed to quite nicely segment these features. And uh, I can also mention that uh, uh, Alexander is now quite, let's say, overbooked with uh, uh, similar, uh, uh, let's say, data sets coming from the synchrotron world because you have so high resolution that uh, the contrast mechanism might uh, be more tricky, let's say. So. We realize that machine learning can really make a difference there. Uh, this is Carl Toy, also from the Loom node and SIFA, and he's very skilled, let's say, in um, uh, trying to uh, create uh, graphical user interfaces, uh, especially when it comes to spectroscopic imaging. Uh, and he's also uh, yeah, been involved in many different projects, uh, and he's also trying now to uh, get her experience in x-ray spectroscopy uh, in respect to imaging as well. Uh, and this is Jonas from, uh, from uh, let's say, Elvis from CIFA at uh, BMC. Uh, a few years ago, I gave him this uh, segmented lung sample from the left asynchrotron in Fiesta. And uh, he took that and he made a STL file. And then he created this virtual world of a future beamline, let's say, uh, at Max Ward and Medmark beamline. Uh, and uh, basically, the user can interact with the beamline, try and understand scanning, reconstruction, and visualization. And then, if you press this button, this uh, line will appear as large as this room, and they can go in and, and explore. And in another example, 
uh, he got data from Scully Sebastian Basterström at Elbic. Uh, this is a confocal image. Uh, it looks a little bit to, uh, 3D, but I think it's actually a 2D image. Uh, and he managed to convert that into a, let's say, scientific rendering. And he actually made a movie of that. So this is, let's say, the user exploring in the real world the, the blood vessel, yeah. actually. So, so this is another type of, uh, of way where you, you get some a, a photo or you get some real data from one modality and then you try and create a, a, a new model, let's say, in the virtual reality world. Uh, and then you can you can explore this for how long you want, let's say, uh, exploring the different blood vessels and the channels and so on. And perhaps you will see some, uh, who knows, some, some defect on, on the blood vessel, maybe some, some fat or something, and then you can realize that they will have an issue. Uh, from the Luna Computing Cluster uh, at uh, Luna University, uh, we have Luna Swindeman, who, uh, who works with, let's say, modeling and also related to construction of buildings. Uh, and there's also Anders Stolin. Uh, and Anders Stolin has, for instance, been involved in this project, uh, which I mentioned briefly before. So they have uh, Shamit Sone from Luna University, who has uh, developed uh, a virtual reality uh, program and platform. And uh, they would usually run it on the stationary computers and it will uh, require a lot of uh, uh, computational resources. What they did under this Intelis pilot project is that they managed to go from, from this upper part where you have a stationary PC connected to headset to a, to a situation where the virtual reality world will be rendered on the cluster and then it will just be streamlined directly to the VR goggles. So you don't need, you personally, you don't need a really strong station or PC. Uh, and Gunther from the design uh, lab, he was also involved in this one, as you can see in the lower right corner. And he's also working with, let's say, applications for uh, educated pilots and drone pilots, let's say. Uh, and I was thinking that we should take a look at this example and there's a video of that as well. This is coming directly from the, from the user uh, and their virtual uh, reality situation. I mean, and this could be, uh, let's say, uh, demonstrated on their stationary PC or, uh, let's say, on the cloud on the lunar cluster. Uh, we don't know, um, let's say, which type of streaming you're using here, but at least this is showing you how they can interact with uh, data and they're actually exploring uh, various cell uh, genome types. Uh, they did some gene expression, let's say. So you can see it's, yeah, it's quite amazing. Um, and then uh, there is Johan Joachim Eriksson from the uh, virtual, uh, virtual reality laboratory at the uh, University. And uh, as you can see here, they have various setups for the users uh, to explore at the virtual reality lab to, uh, let's say, explore various home scenarios. This is actually the most that the user has lifted up something unpaid. So you can see on the level of the detailed interaction that you can make depending on what application you need. Um, and uh, Jens Nilme here from, from the same lab, he worked on some data uh, yeah, with colleagues. This is actually in the lower right corner. This is microtomography data sets of a butterfly from the users Sridhar Halal uh, from the university. And uh, they scan these butterflies. I believe they scan it before the imaging lab uh, at the university. And uh, they are mostly interested actually in the health of this uh, butterfly, but they're not so interested in, in let's say, in the in, yeah, in the wing parts here and so on. So they, they need to clean it up, let's say. And what Jens and colleagues did is they designed a spherical tool that with the help of a VR controller, you can let the user go in and actually segment away these parts that they don't need. And we have a small video of that as well here. So you can see here comes the virtual controller with this spherical, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, feature, the, the red part. Now you need to, I think, decrease it a little bit. I'll be switched to the next view. Uh, and soon, yeah, there you see, you can manage to cut away the parts that you do not want. So, I mean, you can think of it like, it, for certain applications, you might realize that, okay, if we have hundreds of data sets, we can use machine learning to remove certain things and train. If you have fewer samples, perhaps, uh, such tools as this one could be uh, user-friendly enough to let the user uh, segment away these parts that they don't need, and then end up with, let's say, more of the head part, let's say. And uh, yes, 
uh, one uh, another expert is Henrik uh, Garde, who comes from the humanity labs, where they explore the let's say, interaction with data and humans and how the let's say the uh, human body uh, yeah uh, might interact with techniques and how the uh, uh, let's say muscles or uh, yeah, legs might be moving let's say. Uh, from the Uppsala node, uh, they are the first node to actually uh, made a video about uh, their node, and we will take a look at that one, and that comes here. It will be a five-minute video. Uh, uh, yeah, basically silent while it's playing. This is the Olmström Laboratory, one of the largest campuses at Uppsala University, and home to thousands of researchers and students. We are going to talk to Inga Nyström, who is the node coordinator at Uppsala University for the National Research Infrastructure, InfraVis. Hey, welcome to the InfraVis Uppsala node. Scientific research in a growing number of fields relies more and more on the analysis of large amounts of data. Modern visualization techniques may provide a greater level of understanding of the science behind the data revealing features and behaviors that would otherwise be difficult to see. The research of InfraVis receives support through a national health desk, where an application expert is assigned to their project. The support typically includes analyzing the data, selecting suitable software, and scripting the tools. In my role as application expert, I can help visualize research data in various scientific domains. For example, Automated visual inspection in health manufacturing, healthcare, and life science. I provide guidance, technical support, and training in visualizing and understanding large volume of data, as well as assessing the quality of data and extracting insight from data analysis. Located at the English Park campus behind the stunning humanities theater is the Center for Digital Humanities. There is a lot of scientific visualization tools for the arts, humanities, and social sciences. We have graphs, maps, 3D models, and so on. But in the humanities, it is often the case that the visualization is not the end product, but the purpose is to think with images. For example, a 2,000-year-old uh, narrative visualized might be able to help us reflect on migration, transformation, and environmental change of place and space. An important mission for InfraVis is to provide user training. We offer introductory workshops in different software and tools, as well as more advanced programming sessions. The other room is that on the entrance floor at Armstrong Laboratory is a venue specially prepared for visualization training. All scientific disciplines can take advantage of modern visualization to transform large complex data sets into visual forms that enhance human interpretation. It is either used as a general analytical tool throughout the research process or to present results. There are three examples of projects that have greatly benefited from visualization. Combining visualization and surgical planning reduces time spent in operating room. A system developed by the Center for Image Analysis provides surgeons with virtual 3D environments of patient-specific anatomical models of the lower jaw plan the surgical procedures. We've used the system for visualizing and planning bone reconstructive jaw surgeries for soft tissue reconstruction and for complex trauma cases. So virtual surgical planning is present in all reconstructive cases we do today. Carolina Redoliva, the main Uppsala University library, contains thousands of old handwritten documents that are gradually being digitized thus making large collections of handwritten material easily accessible and searchable to everybody. The aim of our research is to do transcription of handwritten documents, and we train our algorithms by using the images of the documents and man-made transcriptions. And by visualizing every part of this process, we can also improve the different algorithms that we are using. Live scientists use modern techniques to sequence RNA and DNA directly at original biological tissue. This allows for a precise link between the genetic information and its cellular location. 
Nadelvi and her research groups have developed tissue maps, a tool for interactive visualization and exploration of millions of data points overlaying high resolution images of the tissue samples. Interviews experts provide state of the art visualization for any scientific domain, as well as equipment, support, and training. We can help you explore your research data contents. Okay. So, yes, that was a very cool video from the Uppsala node. And you can also find this uh, video on YouTube, actually, and also on the Interviews homepage. And uh, I can inform you that we're coming basically to the end of the talk. Uh, but this is the current web page, but if you go into interviews.se right now, uh, you can sign up and receive uh, the interviews uh, information emails, let's say what's going on and so on. You can update yourself on various events, uh, call for applications for this, let's say the large ones where you might need hundreds of hours of work, you, uh, that one should be published sometime next spring. We don't know it exactly yet. Uh, but you can also right now fill in your visa needs, if you have visualization needs, let's say, so you can uh, at least receive up to 80 hours of support uh, for free. Uh, but and uh, when, when you sign up, let's say, uh, and uh, it's also nice if, uh, let's say, your project could at the end be showcased uh, on the Intravis website. So it becomes PR both for user and for Intravis, so that, uh, let's say, the Swedish Research Council who supports this can, can later on see how much Intravis can help. Swedish uh, researchers, let's say. So it's a win win for everyone. Uh, but in approximately two weeks or so, uh, a new Interface web page will be launched. So if you go in in a few weeks, you will see the difference. And there, there will be a lot more information uh, with, uh, let's say, details on the experts, uh, upcoming events and news, and so on. And you can read really, let's say, detailed uh, use, yeah, uh, project uh, stories, let's say. Some of them I showed already today, but there will be a bit more. So, I mean, you can either, you know, click, uh, go into Intervis or you can scan this QR code. Uh, and with that, I thank you for listening. And uh, as a last word, I always like to show this image in the upper right corner as a last take home message, which basically shows you that if you give imaging scientists, I mean, from acquisition to image analysis and so on, or visualization experts, you give them a little bit more time, uh, we can actually create quite some magic from the data. And with that, thank you for listening.